I think we should start so that we're out of here on time. Um, I, I, a lot of you know me. I'm Dr. Shannon Lee. I teach in the biology department, and I'm hosting this week's um, speaker. So uh, Dr. Sean Anderson did his undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara. And he double majored, double majored? Is that what it is? I or graduated two majors. I was a triple major at one point, but I graduated okay. with two majors. So ecology and evolution on one side is part like a bio department, and then environmental studies um, on the other. And then where I met Sean was at UCLA. We were both doing our PhD programs there together. And um, then he went on to do postdoc at Stanford and also became a senior research fellow there. And he's been at Cal State, another Cal State, yay. You! Yay! Come on. Yay! Uh, you guys Channel see Islands, Cataton again. Cal State Channel Islands, which is down in Ventura yep. County. Yep. And um, he has been there on the faculty since 2005. The department he's in, or the program he's in, is Environmental Science and Resource Management. Right now he's the chair of the department, so we're really, we, we squeezed out a tiny bit of time <laughs> to get him up here to talk to us because he's very busy as chair of the department. So. Cool. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for the invite. Um, thanks. So I give various talks. I give like regular science-y talks. That's the bulk of what I've done over, over the years. And we work a lot on natural disasters. So I also get called in fairly frequently to like, tell us what's going on with this thing right now. And you have like five minutes to prepare. Um, rarely do I get to give talks like this, which are much, much uh, intellectually much more fun, which is not so much talk about any one specific thing, but rather be the old dude and kind of talk about some patterns or something. So I really appreciate uh, the offer. So, so thanks, you guys. So I'm going to be talking about um, just run through a few examples of new technologies, and in particular, mostly using examples from our drone, uh, drone work, ro robotic work. Um, but to argue that these new tools can be really, really helpful for our mounting conservation challenges. So I'll start with this picture. This is from the Thomas fire. So this is nine months ago, this was the largest fire, right, in state history, a single fire. And then Mendocino complex, you guys have your thing. So this is, these, these records are falling much too quickly to pay that much attention to, but suffice it to say, um, this is an example of how weird things are getting. So this is about three weeks after the start of the fire, and these guys in Ventura are going surfing but they have to wear N95 particle masks to go surf and, and half face masks. So that should, that's but one indication. You guys have all your indication, indications of how crazy things have been with these natural disturbances and how much of a, a chaotic force they can be to our, our regular routine um, and the like. Also, I should say, if anything doesn't make sense, you guys are more than welcome to interrupt me and, uh, and ask me questions as we go. Um, I'll probably run out of time, so I just want to make sure that I, I acknowledge all of my uh, kick butt colleagues. Uh, most of the work that I can present to you is done by undergrads, undergrads in my lab and in our collaborative lab. So um, we used to call my lab the Pacific Institute for Restoration Ecology, which was the pirate lab, and then I got in trouble because we have a policy about institutes, so we can't call it institutes, so we started calling it pirate lab, and then everybody thought that you're like pirates and you're rebels or something. <laughs> so when we started doing our robotic stuff, which is flying robots and swimming robots, we were trying to figure out a name, and so my students in a very mature, uh, uh, rebuttal to the fact that we couldn't call ourselves the, the, the Pacific Institute. So the, the, it's the Aerial and Aquatic Robotic Research Group. So it's the Pirate R is, the, is our group. And so this is, uh, it's, it's mostly f professors in my program, but it actually draws on folks from across campus. We have computer science folks in there, bio folks, chemistry, sociology, English majors. Um, we have a very open, welcoming um, approach. So everybody can come in and work. And, and this is uh, during the Thomas Fire when we're doing some mapping. Um, I'll show you uh, an image or so later from this, but I, all this work is done by my uh, undergrads, or almost all of it. So my uh, thesis today, uh, what I'm going to argue for you guys, is that this new generation of tools, this, this mix of, of technologies that are available to all of you guys, um, really can improve our ability to measure, assess, uh, manage um, ecosystems. We mostly work in the coastal zone, but pretty much anywhere uh, these technologies have value. So one, they're really, really helpful for dealing with our conservation challenges, I would, I would posit. And secondly, they're very easy to incorporate into your guys' classes, your undergraduate classes, your research projects, um, either for no cost or at a relatively um, minor cost. You, you need you know, hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars, not tens of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. So they really are approachable and usable. Uh, 
by way of introduction, I'll also say that I still like the old tools. This was one of my old technicians just sent me this picture uh, a couple days ago, so I thought I'd put it in. So this is my PhD project where one of the things we did was build these underwater trampling things out at Catalina Island off of Southern California. And uh, so I, I want to make sure that I say I still like all the old tools. We use all the traditional old tools, quadrats, a transect tapes, those are all, all cool. I'm not trying to diss those. Um, but that we, we can use these new allies, and indeed in many cases these new allies give us the edge we need to deal with these conservation challenges. So I snapped this picture when I was leaving my lab yesterday, so these are just some of our robots that we've crashed and that got weird, and so my students are, are fixing those. So, so these old tools married with these new tools are really, really powerful approaches. Um, I should also say, this is one of my old mentors that just retired from teaching 42 years, a, a, a lecturer at UCSB. Mel Manalis, he's a physicist. Another one of my mentors, uh, a guy named Rod Nash, who's a historian of American wilderness. Both those guys talk a lot about, or, or told me a lot about techno fixes. This notion that this one technology is going to solve all our problems. We're going to buy this thing and it's going to suck out all the carbon. So even though I'm going to talk about technology here, I want to make sure that I don't think that these, this is the end all be all of everything. Useful tools, useful helper things, but really, the heavy lifting is really getting our society to deal with a lot of these challenges that we're, um, that we're facing. Um, and then also lastly, for Shannon and everybody here, uh, natural history is the foundation of all this stuff that we do. I'm gonna talk about very little natural history in this talk, so I feel weird since I'm talking about technology, but, but I just wanna acknowledge that natural history is the foundation. You gotta know your plants, you gotta know your animals, you gotta know your fungus, all that good stuff, uh, before you can start to do the, the uh, stuff that many of us want to do. Okay, so the challenge, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but just to make sure we're on the same page. The challenge, obviously, is that our planet is being more stressed in more and more different ways, um, greater pressures, get greater scales, and we can measure this on a whole variety of things. How I typically, um, how I typically think about it is, is like this. Um, over time, our systems, our natural systems, are being more and more stressed. So we have, we have uh, uh, time on the bottom axis, it's now to some amorphous point in the future, and this is ec ecological functioning. So there's whatever your favorite thing is, biodiversity, species richness, um, uh, productivity rates, whatever. Things are, uh, in many areas, in aggregate, um, being stressed and declining. The goal with these new technologies, in any new study or investigation, you guys in your career, whatever it is, um, we're trying to figure out if we can better understand this degradation so that we can reverse it if we know what the drivers are. So really we're kind of, I view this as being a bit of a race between the, the degradation and our understanding and our figuring out what to do to reverse that degradation. And hopefully that happens sooner, right, rather than, than later. Um, this is how I've historically thought about this. Unfortunately in the last few years it's become increasingly clear that maybe this is another issue as well. So it's not just degrading ecological functioning, but it's degrading um, ability of our society to deal with this stuff. So we see it in the fact that we are not together in terms of basic facts on things like climate change. We see it with a disinvestment in the research that we need or the management actions that we need. And so increasingly I'm worried about this, whether we actually have the capacity to respond to these challenges um, once we do sort of understand the system or understand what the, the drivers are. Um, and just these are just some examples from last week. So we have the, the Global Climate, did anybody go to the Global Climate Action Summit? No. Did anybody watch it? Okay, cool, excellent. One, at least two hands, good. We, we have some students that went down, just not in this group. Oh, cool, cool, cool. So, very cool. If you guys haven't seen it, all, most of the presentations are archived. You guys can, can check them out. Very positive, really, um, uh, the notion of we can, we can do something here. So that was great. But at the same time, our president was denying basic research, public research funded, in this case, on the impact of um, the hurricanes in Puerto Rico, just absolutely refuting basic facts. Uh, this last week, we have all the stuff going on the top with North Carolina, Florence hitting. Um, right now, we're having more, the evidence is coming out yesterday and today that we ha have a lot of hog uh, retention basins, uh, hog waste retention basins, uh, coal ash retention basins that surprise, surprise have flooded and are, are, are causing problems in the Cape Fear River system and these other systems. Um, but in general, right, that hurricane is stalled. It was going about two miles per hour for much of this weekend over this area, dumping, you know, 30 inches, 40 inches of rain across the system, 
really, really stressing um, these systems. So again, uh, all this stuff is going on. We would like to be together, at least on the fact that, say, you know, a hurricane is happening or that people have died in a hurricane. But if we can't even get together on that, it gets really hard to get to the next level of, of management response. Okay, enough of that, blah, blah. Okay. So uh, we are in a magic time. It's very, very easy to forget how cool a, a time and place that we are in, especially when there's old guys like me saying, the world's ending, the world's ending, right? So, so really, we really are in a magic time. This is one of my old cell phones. Um, and uh, the cell phone is, is incredible transformation um, uh, uh, aspect for our transformative aspect for our society and you guys probably know this but but it really also is transformative for conservation and a lot of the technologies that we use um, we've seen the costs become incredibly cheaper and cheaper for these processors that are at the heart and the sensors that are at the heart of this of this cell phone um, that you have in your pocket it's getting faster and faster more and more these these devices have uh, incredible, they just barely sip electricity so they can last for much longer on a, on a single charge, whether that's in your pocket or on a seabird flying across the ocean. Um, and because of the scale of this, they become really, really cheap. And because so many of you guys like to play games, the, the motion sensors and things are incredibly accurate and incredibly sensitive. And we can um, build off of all that, those types of technologies. Um, the, uh, the, the next sort of part of this is sort of merging it with all this other stuff. Do you guys have a makerspace on campus, by the way? No. Yeah, awesome. Has, has anybody been there? You guys play with it? Excellent, love it, awesome, good job. So, um, I, so when I was an undergrad at UCSB, I had a key to the machine shop, which was sketch. Why did they give me a key? Because they were stupid, right? So I got in there, <laughs> building stuff all the time, making quadrats, doing all this kind of cool stuff. When I went to UCLA, it was a union shop, and I went in to start making one of these laser beam measure things I was using in the intertidal. And um, they said, this guy said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? I'm like, oh, am I cutting, I'm drilling. I'm like, no, no, dude, $60 an hour, what's the recharge? I'm like, what? And so the, the capacity to innovate there was much reduced. Um, at Stanford, we had, a, a, like you guys have, what we now call maker spaces, which are great. Musicians could use them, professors could use them, undergrads could use them. And those spaces are incredibly powerful and incredibly, uh, they're really great innovation engines. Um, okay. So in my lab, we do a lot of in-house manufacturing. We have a, a largest suite of 3D printers on campus in my lab, and it helped that our campus was brand new when I came. So we didn't have an existing machine shop, so I had to be the machine shop, and nobody got angry that I made myself the machine shop because there, there wasn't a competitor or whatever. Um, new material daily, this, this, so this is just a piece of wood I just, we just printed with our, our department logo um, with this new laser etcher thing called a Glowforge. Um, we, uh, uh, can print in pancakes, we can print on uh, chocolate, we can print in recycled plastic now. Um, all, all kinds of cool stuff, metal, plastics, what have you. That merges with this open source movement, which uh, we typically think of as computer code, but it also includes things like Creative Commons, and people can share uh, uh, material, intellectual stuff, whether that's computer code, code or uh, images or art or what have you. And increasingly, platforms are built to be open. Do you guys, what do you guys use in your statistics class? Do you guys use R or do you guys use a proprietary software? Jump. Jump, okay. Yeah, so the, so the proprietary ones are great, um, but, but there's, now, there's now this other alternative, which, well not now, it's been there for like 20 years, but still, but these, these tools that can embed everything. It's not just some weird aspect over here. They can embed the, they can be embedded in the creation process of the research, of the collection of data process of part of the research, and analysis, et cetera. Um, and then uh, also related to this notion of sharing communities. We might know it as citizen science or collaborative data sharing. Very, very powerful. That allows us to, um, to collect data at the scales that you and I couldn't or would be just insanely expensive if we would ever somehow get a grant for that. Um, and so the sharing community idea scaled up at the scale of your guys' fires, at the scale of the Western US, at the scale of the Western Pacific, whatever, um, can be very, very helpful to get the kinds of data we might need to understand a uh, given conservation challenge. And all that stuff comes together to create, as you guys said, uh, uh, maker spaces in the, the so-called maker movement. Um, so we are basically right now at the cusp of the so-called fourth industrial revolution. So the first was, was mechanization with uh, people didn't have to do the labor with, with uh, heat um, making water boil in England mostly. Uh, and then the second uh, 
Industrial Revolution was this notion of you know, Henry Ford, all that kind of stuff, the assembly line, uh, being much more efficient in terms of creating uh, uh, cars and other types of products, made possible by uh, many things, but including electricity and other social systems also that were at play there. Uh, the third one, um, we're, we're sort of in the third one, just starting entering the fourth one. Third one was really this notion of, of automation that really comes from uh, the digital res re revolution with computers and all that good stuff. Uh, and information technology. The fourth is where we are right now. And so this is really about crossing the boundaries, this fourth industrial revolution that you guys are in. It's defined by uh, a much greater velocity of change, rates of change, new products, new tools coming out much more quickly. The, the scope and the applicability of those tools are not limited to an assembly line in, in, in Michigan or, or Detroit or something like that. And they oftentimes have system level impacts, these technologies. So cell phones and, and the like are not just affecting one little sector, or one group. They have these broad swaths, um, including government. Um, and I already said, things are going really, really fast. The speed of breakthroughs is, is getting really big. There's lots of disruption that comes along, breaking traditional associations and traditional expectations. That can be good, that can also be very bad. And then again, just this really huge, broad depth of change. What does that mean for you and I in terms of conservation stuff? Um, these are some key technologies or, or, or key um, examples of the fourth industrial revolution. And all these red ones are ones that we use right now in my lab and you guys can easily use. And in the very near future, some of this other stuff like artificial intelligence, et cetera, will start entering into the picture in a practical sense. Um, but even just these things right here, robotics, autonomous ability to, for something to pilot itself around, 3D printing, virtual reality, and then the ability to control things, uh, not having to have one central node necessarily to control stuff, really, really helpful um, for so many of our conservation challenges. And then I'll just, uh, by way of introduction, I'll finish by saying that, that this is my campus. Um, I really do think that, that I'm very blessed, very lucky to be in this place. This is, so we're in a former state mental hospital. Some people say we're still uh, and so, uh, so we're right on the, the edge of the Oxnard Plain, so that's a bit, we're surrounded on three sides by agricultural area, and then behind me where, you know, uh, where you are is National Park, a, a National Recreation Area, Santa Monica's National Recreation Area. So we're really on the edge of this, in many senses, li on the literal edge of so many cool things. Um, and uh, being a new place, we've been able to define ourselves how we want, and that's been really innovative and helpful for us doing these things. So we really encourage new thinking in, in, our, in our campus broadly writ, and we, we have no problem doing wholesale overhauls. Because we were so new, everything had to be built, so it was no problem if you wanted to try going that way instead of that way. Um, and again, everything is new, everything ha even though the, the existing buildings, or most of the existing buildings were there since the 1930s, uh, we still had to create everything as a whole. And we have a very diverse uh, student body, which is really, really helpful. My program, which is the Environmental Science and Resource Management program, is um, uh, very interdisciplinary. We have a focus on applied stuff. We don't do that much basic research. We do mostly applied stuff. Um, we're very, very field-oriented, not just in our research, but our teaching and our, our community service. And we have a strong uh, service learning focus. And, um, and some people say that's a unique aspect of CSUCI. I think it's one of the strengths of the CSU system as a whole, whether you guys recognize that or not. The policy, the facilities, this is one of our facilities. This is, so when this, when this place was built, uh, our, our campus was built, it was literally out in the middle of nowhere, so they had to make their own power, they had to have their own, own food production, et cetera. So this was an old hay barn, which we started doing, working on drones and stuff. The FAA had their heads up their butt even farther than they have it up now. Um, they wouldn't let us fly outside, and so we could fly in this area, which was technically not outside, right? but yet the wind blew and the insects went in your face and you had to know how to fly. So we have a lot of this, these really int unique facilities. We have a, a, a runway on campus for model airplanes. At our field station, we have a plane runway. We have all these, these things that uh, just by luck we, we had. Um, also lots of partnerships. We signed the first MOU with NOAA to share data and help them uh, co collaborate on, on drone flights, et cetera. And a lot of great talent in our area as you guys have up here. Also in general, you know, we're really different from a traditional research university, as you guys probably know. Um, even though we do tons and tons of research here, and you guys do, do lots of research here as well, um, we have an educational focus, and that's been a great crowbar entry into all this technology. 
It's much harder to come into this if you have to be the expert in computer programming and start at the 17th level. It's much easier to come in in an introductory type approach in an education context and gain your experience, gain your, gain your foothold, and then, and then uh, attack from there. Again, applied and interdisciplinary are really, really key. Um, there's a huge interplay between this technology, this equipment, and, and what we're making, and, and the approach to dealing with whatever it is, education, conservation, science, what have you, and it really is this positive uh, feedback loop. This is one of uh, the first two fixed wing units that we were given several years ago that started us down use, on the path of using robotics, and the long story short is these guys said, hey, do you want this? And I said, hell yeah, I want that. What do you do with it? I don't know, but it's like cool, so let's do something with it. And so our president, who's a great guy who's since retired, our, our original president, but, but he, he was really great, he had to approve all these donations, and when this went up to him to be approved, he denied it. I said, what? He said, oh yeah, drones, man. No, drones, people think Afghanistan, they think blowing up people, they think spying. You know, we don't want to be a part of that. It's like, no, 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 I don't want to blow anybody up. I don't want to spy on anybody, but we want to use this. And so to his credit, he said, well, maybe I'm wrong, but these are my concerns. Can you address those concerns? And I went, oh, God. So it's not just a concern of us, it's a concern of everybody. I can tell you stories if you guys want later about um, the silliness of places like the LAPD and what they've done incorrectly. But what it made us do is it made us set me down a year and a half path of talking to lawyers, uh, you know, campus lawyers, CSU lawyers, state lawyers, meetings, 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 and we created a policy on so-called unmanned systems, so for drones. Just like if you, we did a psychology experiment, or you guys in one of your psychology classes, you did, did one of these things, or a biomedical experiment, you have to get approval, human subjects approval, we essentially created the same thing. So if we're gonna use a drone for a class, if we're gonna use a drone for research, we run this by this group, which is made up of folks on campus, as well as outside folks, and we just say, yeah, you know what, you should probably make sure you have a fire extinguisher or whatever the, the, the issue is to make sure we're doing it great. And this has now become, I apologize, a requirement for you guys. So it's now a requirement of all 23 campuses <coughs> that you guys have to, you don't have to use this exact policy, but you have to meet this or exceed this. And so here I thought we were the backwater and every 12 year old's buying and flying these things off Amazon and I'm trying to fly these and like, no, it's been a year and a half to make a policy. And I was like, oh my God. Um, like selling my son. Uh, and so, uh, so it turned out to be really, really helpful. And that notion of confronting the controversial stuff head on, not hiding it, not trying to pretend it doesn't exist, but, but dealing with it has been very, very helpful and I argue is really, really central to using these new technologies for societal benefit and for conservation benefit. Uh, as I said before, I, I touched on this, but this notion of this interplay between teaching and learning, and that's really our entry point. So our first robotics-related grant stuff came from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as an educational thing. And we, we purchased these uh, kits from a, a, a startup in Berkeley. These are open ROVs. Anybody use any of these open ROVs? Okay. So very, very cheap. This is like 700 bucks. Um, and, and we originally got those to do basic education, and then that became our, those became our, some of our first research <coughs> platforms. And from there, we're able to develop all kinds of great skills and capacities, et cetera. Our approach to using these new technologies is really peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So like I said, sociology kid can come in, English kid can come in, don't know anything. It's like, okay, gosh, why don't you watch this video on what like, electricity is? Like, oh, okay. And then like, what's soldering? I don't know. And then they start, and then the, the kids with a little bit of skill mentor those new students. The students that are intermediate are mentored by the experts and so on and so forth. So we have this peer-to-peer -peer or near-peer mentoring that's proved very, very useful um, throughout all the development of all these technologies. In addition to that, we do a lot with uh, our local schools, our local K through 12. And so, for example, this is one of our um, uh, maker spaces slash classrooms for our local high schools that come here once a week. So kids in high school can um, get, uh, 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 originally they were trained to be pilots, now they're being trained, uh, uh, airplane pilots, now they're trained to be uh, drone pilots. So we do that kind of stuff as well. Originally we were bursting at the seams, this is our first lab, and uh, a couple years ago we moved into a new building which has been transformative for us, so having the space we can build stuff and we have our, our, our toxicological stuff in another lab and the electronic stuff in a different lab, that's been um, very, very helpful. We do a lot of vetting of technology, so these are all things, and, and all this stuff we do very, very cheaply. So on the upper left, it's a little dark, you see one of my uh, former students, um, we couldn't build a, a high quality VR display, so we cut open a welding helmet and put a phone in it, and that's our virtual reality 
display. Um, so all this stuff is, we're constantly vetting stuff. We're technology agnostic. We use these platforms that work right now. If something better works next week, we're gonna switch to that. So we're not, we're not tied to any one particular uh, platform or company or anything like that. There's constant learning. So this is one of our field sites. This is in uh, the South Pacific and uh, everything always breaks. So we have to be able to fix stuff on the fly. So there's constantly figuring out how to, and again, I can tell you guys all kinds of funny uh, stories if you want later. Um, and we've taken that stuff and built new classes from that. So we we're both embedding this new technology in courses as well as um, uh, a developing wholesale new courses like this, which is our introduction to remotely piloted systems. Mostly we've taught that as a drone class, but it can also be taught as an underwater ROV class as well. And this is a, this is a, a runway on campus, our model airplane uh, runway. Okay, so that's some background. I wanna run through some different examples for you guys of some of the value of this technology and some of the insights and, and how we use it. And again, feel free to interrupt me if I'm, I feel like I'm going very fast and uh, afraid that we're gonna get kicked out of here. So, so ask me any questions you guys want. Um, the first thing I'll say is this technology is very nimble. So these are some fixed wings. There's one of our underwater units I talked about already. There's a, a quadcopter, very, very nimble um, and flexible and adaptable. So for example, when the Refugio oil spill started um, in 2015, we grabbed our stuff and went out and could throw it on a boat and start looking for underwater oil deposition within hours. So very, very flexible. Um, we also have um, all kinds of uh, other applications. This is doing tree demography in some of our restoration sites in New Orleans, or just, just south of New Orleans. And so here we typically measure the heights of trees. What we're doing here is we're flying up one of our units and we're using the altimeter, so the, tree's gonna, the drone's gonna look horizontally, and then we're able to say, ah, this tree is X tall. Sounds very simple, but in a complex canopy, it's hard to, to get the exact tree height without spending lots and lots of time. And we're doing, we're surveying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trees um, during our survey. So this stuff is really, really useful. And it, um, it turns out that uh, the, the drone tells us uh, how good we are compared to um, uh, the human observations versus the drone estimate. If we were perfect, it would be a one-to-one. -one, but for the most part, it's pretty good. There's only one guy who's really bad at it, but I won't say who that is because he's the head of the UCLA herbarium. So I don't want to say his name, Tom Huggins. But everybody else is, uh, is, is pretty good. But right, we can do these, these very robust estimates, really, really helpful, very practical, you know, very practical in nature, um, that this drone, for very cheap, very, very short amount of time, um, can really uh, uh, help us um, move forward. Also, these, these tools can help us reduce our impacts. So the first example here, I'll show uh, several slides. This is, just a, this is an ongoing project. So um, uh, we, have, uh, we do a lot of work on sandy beaches. Uh, my colleagues and I do. And uh, this is, these are our model snowy plovers. So these little shore nesting birds. Um, and, this is, and this is in a little cage here. So out, out in the field, we've sometimes put cages around their nests so the predators, either do, uh, associated with people or native predators like corvids, crows, and things, don't attack and kill these guys. And so we've been doing surveys. The challenge with surveys for these guys is um, uh, these, particularly the corvids, particularly these, these crows, they're so gosh darn smart, they figured everything out. So um, whenever we walk up, if you walk up to do a survey, they're like, oh dude, there's food over there. And they come and they, they kill the birds or the chicks or the eggs or whatever. So then researchers started putting popsicle sticks by the nests and then just hanging way far off and then just once they found them, you know, use binoculars to label them and, and to monitor them over the course of the summer, say, then the birds figured out popsicle sticks mean food. And so, so the, the, these birds are very, very um, creative. So we're trying to see if we can use our drones to survey these very small, very cryptic, hard to see um, uh, birds that blend in well with their environment. So this is um, our, this, in this particular case, this is our, our study site. This is Ormond Beach, which is in Ventura County. Um, and uh, there's this big power plant over here to the right, which I can tell you about. And there's a big salt, uh, marsh restoration we've been working on for several years I can tell you about if you want to know about that but this is a complex right so it's a dune complex very complex very rugose vegetation sand all that good stuff um, with our uh, oops, sorry my, my word my word squeezed off the screen here but um, the traditional standard uh, easily gettable uh, satellite image and, and stuff you could find is on the left so of, of this beach so you know can, you can tell something's there but it's not the great one this is the resolution we get with our drones at about 100 feet off the ground or 150 feet off the ground. We use, so our default approach to doing these kinds of, of mapping efforts is to use an autopilot routine. So um, we use off the shelf stuff, 
Um, and this is essentially a lawn mowing pattern that the drone will fly and, and take pictures with a certain amount of overlap of these images. We, then we take these images together and we photo stitch them. This looks like a photo, it's not. It's actually a point cloud. So we create a three-dimensional model from all these still images and then create a topology from that, in this case a point cloud, and then we take the images after this and we re-stretch the images over it and we make um, a, a real, a very accurate um, map of the site. You can do all kinds of stuff with that. So this is the same image above and below. The top one is a, is a topographic model of the beach, so the ocean is to the bottom of the screen and the top is uh, inland. And so the top one is height, so this is the little dune patches and vegetation patches. This bottom one is um, NDVI, so the greenness index, so we can look at how, much, how many plants are on there. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. But the main thing we were trying to do with this is can we find the birds? And the answer is yes, you can. So this is with an infrared camera, and, uh, what, and each of those circles is a bird. Um, so it turns out it's, it works really well. We can identify birds really well. Uh, but our snowy plover, which is our target, actually looks very, very similar to a sanderling. So we have to merge this infrared with RGB, with a regular spectrum image, and then we can actually tell. And so, um, so this was a huge controversy. It took us several years to get permission to do this um, because uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service are great folks, but um, they, uh, they're very paranoid about stuff like endangered species, right? So getting permission to fly our drones over endangered species is, like, well, I don't know about that. And, and now after we sh we've been out there and showed them, we've had actually cameras, cameras, all, all these nests as we fly over to see if we're disturbing the birds at all. And it turns out we have no significant impacts. And now all of a sudden they're like, this is great, we gotta do this more. Let's go, do this, all these nests and everything. So in, in fact, with a lot of this technology, that's actually the key. The key to getting people's acceptance for most of this stuff is a 30 second or 60 second uh, YouTube video. Because people um, understandably have a lot of trepidation about this technology and they're, saying, I don't know about this, you know, we have a sensitive environment here, whatever. They really don't, can't conceptualize of the benefit or, or, or what, how this technology would play out in their system. Having a short video is incredibly helpful for the permitters, for the community, for, for you know, all these different folks. And we, we're now doing things like we're able to quantify birds inside human footprints and inside uh, uh, tracks, all that kind of good stuff. We're also using this in, um, this is work of my colleague Rachel Cartwright. So uh, she has an NGO, so we take students to Hawaii every, um, usually spring break, we're switching to take them over winter break. So in this case, we're doing uh, mother calf studies in the Maui Channel. And they used to do this from boats. Right? And mom's like, what the hell is that? Right? Now we fly these drones over them. The whales don't see them or they think they're seagulls or something. They behave normally. And we can get all kinds of wonderful morphometrics from this. How, you know, what's the mom's girth and all this great stuff. So, um, so really, really helpful, really, really um, transforming the research we're able to do there, uh, in this case on marine mammals. Um, this technology is also can be, is inherently, potentially very, very collaborative from the get-go. Some of our other stuff is, is maybe less so, but um, the, the best example of this is, this is our, our first class trip to the Cook Islands, um, which is a, a service learning class that we teach. And um, this is, uh, there's a bunch of stories here, but um, uh, I'll just say, this guy over here on the lower left, he was a master's student at Plymouth Marine Lab in the UK. And they had one of our ROVs, or, or, or the same kind of ROV, and we got known as, the people you call when you break it and you don't know how to fix it. Like people, some people send us emails and we would diagnose problems, you know, virtually on YouTube and things like that and tell them, oh, you should do this. And so we f helped them fix their machine and they were looking at actually, um, uh, they have a bunch of money from cancer research to look for fluorescent proteins with the idea being, can we tag a cancer cell inside your, your arm or whatever and then shine some regular light, not x-rays or something, but just regular light and, and, and see, essentially see, make that cancer, that tar t targeted tissue glow. And they started off looking at uh, corals and um, cnidarians, and so we essentially helped them, and so we, they built the, the light, and we built the other parts, and we flew across the planet, and we met in the Cook Islands, we're like, oh my God, I hope this works, I hope this works, and it fit together, we're like, woo! Then we looked brilliant, right? But at the first, we were like, oh my God, is this gonna work? So you truly can collaborate across the world for this, and we saw all kinds of cool stuff, like we think now we can see um, coral banding disease before you see it visually, and some other cool things uh, from that first collaboration. This technology is also, um, can be really helpful in terms of accessibility. 
Um, so uh, typically we're used to doing fish surveys with, with scuba diving, that, that's my background, um, and that's still a, a key part, but um, some folks can't because of uh, physical issues or, or, um, or other uh, limitations, uh, can't, uh, can't go scuba dive. We can use this technology to do similar things, not exactly the same, but, but similar things, and indeed we have a photographic record. So for things like oil spills or fish counts, we actually have it documented um, in terms of um, a, a visual archive that you can go back and check again. Um, in this case, we're looking at how many fish are inside a marine protected area, how many fish are outside a marine protected area. This technology can also, um, this is one of the most powerful things, give us new perspectives we don't typically have. So um, this is our, our very first, this is several years ago, this is our, our very first, uh, this is a, a cliff in Santa Barbara. This is from one quick flight with none of our now fancy GPS stuff where we get it much more higher resolution. This is one flight and <clears throat> this is on a, a website you guys can play with and you can zoom in and at this first stage you could get to be about a foot, foot and a half resolution. So you can do a flight and if it's a, a, a sensitive species, do a flight over it, land and then do the nest counting and stuff later. So we're not at the site attracting predators and doing all that kind of uh, cool stuff. You can do morphometrics, all kinds of stuff. My colleague, Dr. Kiki Patch, does a lot of coastal morphology. So she does sand budgets, sediment budgets, and we use this technology um, all the time to look at the changing shape of our beaches, for example. Uh, we, we're now, um, we've built our own LIDAR, and so now we're doing a, a LIDAR, we're using LIDAR to, to measure things, which is a much more precise way of doing stuff. After our most recent fire that burned our campus, which was the Springs Fire. Thomas Fire is a little bit farther away from our main campus, but our, the entirety of our campus burned up. The building survived. Afterwards, we got some, some rapid data from NSF and, um, and, and monitored this, air, this area behind our campus. Uh, $30,000 to do an area, um, I don't know how big this building is, but one, one or two footprints of this building, this little watershed, right? Took forever, kept being foggy. The pilot kept calling off, calling off. Finally, eventually flew it. Took six months to get the data back. When we got the data, it was awesome but it was incredibly expensive to take a long time. Our first drone that we built with a LiDAR on it was $13,000 complete. We can fly that right before the rain event, right after the rain event, right before the fire, right after the fire. And, we can, and that $13,000 will work until the thing dies. So much more cost efficient and it puts in your guys' hands the potential for much more precise stuff. You can both do geomorphology or you can do things like biomass in terms of this uh, forest uh, using LiDAR. Um, and uh, yeah, we do all kinds of neat stuff. So this is uh, the Thomas Fire. Um, and this is some of our beaches in Montecito where we're dumping, is on one of our long-term monitoring sites, they're dumping mud and sludge onto our site, which they said we, we couldn't go see. So we just, you know, use a drone. And, uh, and so we're looking at, looking at the footprint there. Um, this is actually, this isn't a, uh, this is a, a rough map. This is the first draft map but we can actually do things like quantify impacts in very, very quick, very, very real time. Um, I'm gonna run out of time here, so I'll skip some of these, but I'll just say that uh, uh, this is um, right after the Thomas fire, this is Matillaha Dam, one of these dams we've been trying to pull out, and one of the things the county guys said, hey, can you go do us a favor, go look at the slopes, see how much they're eroding, or, or see, can you throw out some models for us to tell us how quickly stuff's eroding, and the answer is yes. We can get out there with this technology and rapidly um, look at how denuded the hillsides are, et cetera, right after the fire comes through. We also, in the case of the area right behind the, the downtown Ventura, the city hall, which is next to San Buenaventura Mission, the original mission, Winipra Serra Mission, um, the fire burned through and in this botanical garden and revealed all of this stuff, these walls that, that people didn't know were there. So this archeology span that people had not seen, the structure for at least 100 years, 150 years, we rediscovered, so we flew our drones over it to do high resolution mapping so that in the subsequent rains when the mud came down the hillsides or whatever and buried it, uh, you know, after the fire um, or after the, the rainy season, our archaeological colleagues could come in and know exactly where this cultural resource was. So, so telling human stories with this technology is also really um, powerful and useful. Um, our, our most recent, uh, well we have a couple, but, but one of our most recent um, fire projects is this. So um, this is a burning oil seep. So Ventura has tons and tons of oil. The first oil wells in the state were in Ventura. Um, and this is a naturally occurring seep next to the 150, this, this freeway here, and it's on fire. And it's burning not at the surface, it's burning subsurface. Very, very hard to put out. And so it turns out that um, a large, about 25% of all of the naturally occurring oil seeps in our county 
um, were, were potentially burned in the Thomas fire. So we're now using our drones, we're building with some money from the California Air Resources Board, we're, we're mixing uh, uh, regular spectrum cameras with um, infrared and then uh, volatile organic carbon sniffers on these units to both find uh, seeps that are still burning um, at the surface, which you can see smoke, or just the heat source, or some of these mine shafts. We have asphalt mines, some of which are more than 100 years old, that we think the, the timbers and stuff started burning and brought fire down underneath. So you wouldn't necessarily see the heat signature, but we could, we could smell the, the burning uh, organics. So we can do that, and this is very, very uh, um, t complex terrain. It's very difficult to walk to these sites or get to these sites on, by cars or whatever, but our, our drones can fly over um, and get to them quite quickly. This is also part of a collaboration with a lot of our middle schools to teach uh, local kids about, about air quality and help them understand what the air quality is like in their neighborhoods to empower groups that have historically been disenfranchised from uh, the environmental process. Um, and I'll say these things are, are, are cheaper than some of our traditional ways of doing stuff. Um, this is just an assessment that I'll, I'll just touch on and go on, but, but can be much more fast, much more accurate, much cheaper than um, our traditional survey techniques. Um, we develop a lot of tech, uh, technology as well, and we also support a lot of groups doing this stuff. So this is uh, a nonprofit in East Africa that we help them build units, and then we, we give the units to them, and they use them uh, to, to in, with their education and their monitoring. Um, and so that's been really, really cool. A lot of the tools that you guys have access to right now, we do a lot of uh, open source stuff, not just with robotics, but also with computing and websites and things like that. So when we had the Thomas fire, we spun up a temporary website that really quickly ported all the data for the public. And so we, we um, can make data available and, and help organize resources very, very quickly for, um, uh, for folks. And again, all of this is totally within your guys' purview. This, is, this, sounds really, this is not doing um, command line programming, right? This is using uh, WordPress and all these other great tools that make it possible for those of us that aren't computer scientists to do this stuff. It also allow, these technologies also allow for new conversations, I would posit. Um, so this is, uh, we, uh, this is one of the first things we got to buy into. This is the DARPA challenge, the robotics challenge. And so this is mostly, mostly a bunch of engineers and we were invited to show up and tell them how we do our education so we can have these conversations with some of our technical colleagues, um, but also other folks. So this is an electronic jellyfish that we built with some of our um, some of our marine debris research. And so this is a light up, this is a bunch of water bottles that we recovered and then um, and it, and people were so impressed with it, um, they took it to the Getty Museum in LA and it's, it's been exhibited in the Getty. So ways to engage with the public outside of the classroom with these new technologies are really, really cool. And the technologies that, that you know, the students building these, these interactive LED displays and stuff are the same exact ones, they're, same skills they're using when they're assembling these ROVs and fixing these drones and stuff. Uh, and then, um, this is uh, from a few years ago, but this is uh, Aitutaki uh, in the Cook Islands. And we get there, it's a remote thing, it looks all like pristine, like, oh, it's like a postcard, and this is great. And what do you hear? Eee, like, what the hell is that? And it's a, it's a, a phantom, a DJI phantom. This guy's flying it, we're like, who's flying that? And so we went up to talk to the guy, some Yahoo from, some Yahoo Kiwi, right? So we got this thing for present, uh, for, a present for Christmas, he's out there flying it. And not only is this, everybody's trying to enjoy the beach and relax and everything, it's like eh, but he's also right in the middle of the flight, right at the end of the runway of the, the one airport on uh, this, case, this area, right? So these technologies are very, very powerful and they can be used for good or evil, right? And so we gotta be honest about that. So we've been do, we also do a lot of engagement with the public in terms of their perceptions of these technologies. So in this case, this is our, our we've been doing a public opinion poll for 13 years, 14, I don't know, 14 years, something like that now. Not just about technology, but all different management of the coast, how people perceive oil spills and, and uh, all that kind of stuff, which we do with, with undergrads in one of our classes. So they provide all the labor, and it's a really, it's a really transformative experience for their learning, um, learning environment in the classroom. Um, but just one little small example here I'll show. Happy to talk about opinion polls forever. I'd love to talk to you guys about opinion polls. Um, but uh, this is just from the 2014 year. And one of the things we ask them is, hey, what do you uh, think about uh, you know, small unmanned you know, drones flying around in, in the area, you know, by your house or in the coastal zone or whatever? And they could say very bad to you know, good or whatever. And so if, you, if we combine the negative views, that's about a third-ish of the folks. 
if we say people that think it's a good thing, it's about half that. And that's often where the conversation goes. When you look at articles in the newspaper or television stories or something, right? So it's, it's bad versus good. That's, that's BS. That's not the real story, right? The real story is the neutral and the unsure. So if we add those up, that's about 60%. It's about 60% of the public has not decided if this technology is good or bad. That's, that's the point of engagement, right? So these folks potentially could see this as a value, potentially could see this as a horrible thing. And so by having honest conversations, we can, we can um, take these folks to a point where um, we can maybe not have some of the, the constraints on this technology that'll prevent us from using it, but yet have the appropriate constraints for things that are inappropriate, like spying on you in your backyard and things of that nature. So, um, so this notion of truly engaging people with what they think is, a, is another key part of this thing. We do a lot of immersive learning, and Shannon's standing up, so I'm about done. But I'll say, um, we do a lot of immersive learning too, so three th virtual spaces and three-dimensional stuff. Again, it used to be very complex, it's not complex. You can get some of these, these spherical cameras, these 360 cameras, for about 300 bucks now, 200 bucks. So you don't need to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars. This technology is from the 1800s, so you can do virtual reality even back in the 1800s. Um, and uh, you can do fancy stuff like this, bring people into underwater spaces. This is, uh, we're collaborating with some, with some colleagues at Cal Poly Slow, where we're trying to do virtual scuba dives off of piers and things to, to uh, allow folks that can't go underwater or is like an intro class kind of thing, exposing them to stuff. And you can interact with whales and things. It's also, there are also opportunities to do broader engagement. So this year will be our third annual drone data race where we teach people, well, where we, we, we turn this into a fun competition. So we have some actual hazards. Anybody in the community can compete. You can win money. You come out, you pay, and you fly the course. The first year was a mock oil spill. You had, to, you had to do a race, and you had to come back and tell us how much oil was out there. Last year was a wildfire. We actually planned it before the Thomas fire. Actually, it's where it got. And before your guys' fire, we actually planned it before that. But everybody thought we made it. Um, so I don't know what this year's theme is, but it's in spring. You guys are welcome to come down. Anybody can participate. We have high school kids participate. We have, we have you know, retired folks participate. All you have to do is bring a drone. And any kind of drone, not to be fancy. The fancy guys always lose. The fancy guys, that will go like 7,000 miles an hour, and they crash. Right? And last year, um, uh, I, this is, I probably shouldn't say this, but my son won. And it was like, it was like it's rigged. I'm like, no, no, I did And he just grabbed a, his off-the-shelf thing. and. So, so these kinds of experiences are key. Uh, we're doing all kinds of virtual stuff. And uh, the things people typically think of are things like climate change, right? So sea level rise, having virtual viewers where you can hold up these instruments and see in augmented reality what a higher sea level would be. That is very, very simple. All of the new, iPhone, all the new updates for iPhones have all the software built into this. So with, this is a little bit more of a heavy lift, but, but you guys could do this with your colleagues from computer science. Very, very simple. Um, and, and these tools are becoming more and more user friendly as we go. So um, just to, and I'll say we do a lot of citizen science, um, such as things like tracking wildlife deaths after uh, wildfires. In this case, it's a Thomas fire. We're also trying to work on this this year with across California, but where people can report for us mortality events of particularly large bodied animals that we have been monitoring for several years, but the distributed citizen science approach is much more helpful than us driving around indiv as individuals looking for deaths. Um, and I'll just say to finish up, uh, again, this challenge, right? Our goal is to take all this cool new technology and try to put, push this understanding curve of these ecosystems uh, higher so we can intervene uh, more quickly. And then again, uh, lastly, uh, uh, I argue this can really help us uh, do stuff more cheaply, more efficiently, and you guys can use it in your classes and all that kind of great stuff. Happy to talk with you guys about how to do that. And these are some of our websites, our department website, ESRM Zone. Uh, my website and then our, our aero and aquatic robotic research uh, website. Uh, love to talk to you guys further and we probably got to get out of the room. So thanks you guys. Mm -hmm.